as I was in my office listening to the worship. And the song, I'm deep in love with you, Lord. I'm deep in love with you, Lord. Really just once again spoke to my heart. I am deep in love with you, Lord. My heart beats for you. Sometimes my heart burns hot like a blazing fire and, and then it's kind of like I just want to go and do and, and I want to start fires here and start fires there in people's hearts. And then other times when all the busyness of the church and the frustrations as a pastor that you can sometimes have because you're not perfect, <laughs> you still have to deal with life and with people's lives and sometimes it gets to be almost overwhelming. And then if you add a little bit of uh, illness on top of it, it can then for, for sure seem like overwhelming. And so in the two weeks that I was at home and had lots of time to think, I began to ask a question. I began to say, Lord, what am I doing here? What am I doing here at Cornerstone Church? Lord, how much longer do you want me here? Is it this year? Is it next year? Ten years from now might be a lot to hope for. But, you know, I, I don't know, Lord. What am I doing here? Because, Lord, sometimes I get tired. Sometimes I get really frustrated. Because sometimes I wonder, Lord, why it seems like there's oh, such a few that really have a heart burning and on fire. Why is that, Lord, after seven years of trying to start fires over here in this section and trying to start fires over here in this section and trying to start fires over here in this section, why is it after seven years that all I feel are, are just low-burning low coals? Lord, it's only things your Holy Spirit can do. I can't do them. I can't do them. And I realize that some of this comes to me when I'm at a low point because of physical things that are going on in my body. But still, the question is there. What am I doing here? And then the Lord began to show me some things that different people here, that some of them are not here today, but are definitely a part of our family, of the changes in their lives, the changes in their families' lives, how people have grown, many people have grown, but not enough people have grown. I'm telling you, I'm sharing my heart with you now. We're not to the message, I'm sharing my heart with you. And I pray that while I'm gone, I believe that God's going to speak to me while I'm in South Africa. He's already given me the message for the Sunday I come back. I hate that when I get messages months ahead of time. Because <laughs> then I'm not sure what to do with them. But I know this one, when I come back, I'll sort out some things. So even when the distraction and the busyness of the schedule here at the church seems overwhelming, I know that I have to return to the fire. I have to get back into chair one. I have to sit next to warm coals, the warm coals of the Holy Spirit, and I listen to him. Because all the noise that's around me here in the church, in other places, all the sounds from different people, all the sounds that I hear coming, all the sounds in the spiritual realm can be overwhelming sometimes and when I pray then I begin to feel the wind of the Holy Spirit I begin to feel the wind of the Holy Spirit coming through me blowing away all the questions blowing away all the feelings of being overwhelmed sometimes and in its place comes a peace of knowing I'm where God put me for his timing and his timing only so I just wanted to share that with you. And I pray that while I'm gone, you'll do some praying. What does God want from you? What does God want from us? <coughs> All right. Shall we go to the message? Okay. Back when the uh, telegraph was the fastest method of long-distance communication, a young man applied for a job as a Morse code operator. Answering an ad in the newspaper, he went to the office address that was listed, and when he arrived, he entered a large, busy office filled with noise and clutter and clatter and sound, and seven other applicants were waiting in that particular area. After a few minutes, the young man stood up, crossed the room to the door of the inner office, and walked right in, closed the door behind him. 
Naturally, the other applicants perked up, wondering what was going on. They muttered among themselves that they, they hadn't heard any summons yet. How come did he just go walk into that office? They assumed that the young man that went into the office made a mistake and he would automatically be disqualified. Within a few minutes, however, the employer escorted the young man out of the office and said to the other applicants, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming, but the job has just been filled. The other applicants began grumbling to each other and one spoke up saying, wait a minute, I don't understand. He was the last to come in. He ne we never even got a chance to be interviewed, yet he got the job. That's not fair. The employer said, I'm sorry, but all the time you've been sitting here, the Telegraph has been sending out the following message in Morse code. If you understand this message, then come right in. The job is yours. <laughs> None of you heard it or understood it. This young man did, and the job is his. Do you know where we're going this morning? <laughs> Are our ears tuned to his voice? Are we really tuning in to the voice of the Holy Spirit? There are some things that really interest me about this particular story that I just shared with you. This young man was not the first one there. He wasn't the best dressed. He maybe wasn't even the best qualified. There were many men who had come who were better dressed, many men who maybe had a better education, who maybe had been there very early. They got there early so they could be the first to be interviewed. Maybe each one was telling each other how good they were and that they should have this job. But the reason this young man got the job, because he was listening for the right voice. Mm -hmm. Listening. Mm -hmm. Something we Americans have a hard time doing is listening. Somehow he had eliminated all the distractions and he was just listening and he heard the right voice. All the outside influences, he was just listening. While the others were preoccupied with conversations, although worthwhile, they may have been, they missed the main message. While others were talking among themselves, that small, unobtrusive voice was speaking all the while. But they didn't hear it. The Holy Spirit is speaking all the while, but very few hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And some people say to me, well, how do I hear the Holy Spirit? Listen. That's my sound advice. I can't think of anything in more theological than listen. You just have to listen. It's the quietest sound. But even though that Morse code in that room was the quietest sound, it was the most important sound in that room. And only one person heard it. The ones who will hear the still small voice of Jesus in this generation are the ones who eliminate all the distractions. <coughs> what are those distractions that we have? Can you tell me? What distractions do you have? This is interactive this morning. Busyness of life. Busyness of life. Wow, that covers all. You didn't have to cover it all in one fell swoop. What, what, uh, what's in that? A to-do list. list. What? Job. Job. TV. TV. Biggie. Computer. Computer. Radio. Radio. Worries. Worries. Entertainment. Children. Children. Grandkids. Grandkids. Those are children too, by the way. <laughs> Okay, what <laughs> flesh of fleshly desires. Stuff. Stuff. What? My eyes. My eyes. Okay. So the ones who block out all outside influences and concentrate on what God's saying amid the clutter and the hubbub of ill everyday life, those are the ones that are going to change things around them. That's the only ones. And so, so, you know, there's something else that distracts us that's very personal. So for me, what can distract, one of the things that can distract me is me. Yes. I mean, I can get all wrapped up in me. Yeah. I know I'm probably the only one here. Get all wrapped up in me. My needs. Yes. You don't understand, I hurt today. My wants, my desires. My dreams, me. <laughs> okay, so, um, and so when we finally realize that all these distractions keep us from hearing his voice, then what are we going to do about it? Then we have to make a decision to do something about it. And that decision involves some discipline. 
there's that D word. Nobody likes discipline. So, so when we finally, uh, have you ever been in a situation where somebody said something to you and you didn't really quite hear it all, and you say to them, "Excuse me, I, I didn't catch what you said," and they say, they think, "Why not?" And I think, "Because I wasn't listening. I, I kind of heard you mumbling out there, but, but I, I really don't know what it is you're trying to say." And we have all had people say something to us when we were daydreaming or otherwise preoccupied with something else and we didn't really hear. And so maybe they said, you need to go do something, but we really didn't hear them, so we don't go do it because we really weren't that interested in what they had to say. Now, that wouldn't be me. I'm always interested in what everybody has to say. But you understand what I'm saying. Have you had people come up to you to say something to you and you really weren't that interested in what they had to say, so you really didn't really completely listen. But you nodded and said, yeah, I agree. Uh-huh. Fine. Oh, the church is on fire? I didn't realize that's what you said. So we need to really listen. So when what we really mean is, I heard, but I didn't understand you. I knew you were talking to me, but my mind was preoccupied with other things, and I didn't understand what it was you wanted me to hear. So in order to hear what God is saying, we have to remove all the distractions. Now that's, some would say, near impossible. And it is nearly impossible, all the distractions. So how do we do that? Nobody's jumping up with an answer. Be still. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. When do we get, when do the most distractions come upon us when we're, when we're in a stressful situation, right? When we're stressed about something, whatever it is, that's when we, ha it's hardest for us to hear. When we're all stressed out about something that has happened or something that's about to happen or something that we have built up in our minds that might be going to happen, that's when we have the hardest time hearing. That's when we sometimes say, no, God doesn't talk to me. Yeah, I'll bet he does. If you're just listening, if you have the Holy Spirit within you, the Lord wants to speak to you and he uses it through the Holy Spirit and he doesn't leave you alone. But after a while, have you ever, you know, sometimes if somebody texts me on my phone, I get a little beep. And if I don't answer the text, it beeps again. And then if I don't answer it, it beeps again. I just love it. <laughs> so finally, I will reach over and turn my phone off. How many of us do that with the Holy Spirit? How many of us turn it off? <laughs> because we think we don't want to hear. We don't want to hear. I've got too many things saying. I'm going to turn to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, uh, verses, starting with verse 1. I'm going to read starting with verse 1 through verse 10. In the year of King Uzziah's death, this is Isaiah speaking, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what that must have been like when Isaiah was in the spirit and the Lord gave him, he didn't give him a vision, he opened up his eyes so he could see what was going on in heaven. And he points out the year, and he says, in the year of King Uzziah's death, which was, by the way, just so you know, in 7, 758 B.C. is when Uzziah di died. 2, verse 2, Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. Verse 3, and one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Four, and the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Verse 5, then I said, woe is me, because when Isaiah got a glimpse of the Lord, he then saw himself. When we really see who God is, when we really have a revelation of who God is, then we see ourselves. We have a revelation of who we are and we are nothing. Now, I don't mean that in a negative sense. 
I mean that in a positive sense because God chose us so we're something, okay? But we're nothing when we think of the power and the awesomeness and the holiness of a God Almighty that is over this entire earth. Why would we be discouraged when we know that God is in control even when all things seem out of control? And so when he saw God, when he had a vision of God and the power of God and he heard the angels singing and the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke, then he said, Woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. Now Isaiah was a prophet. So I'm sure that Isaiah led a pretty good life. I mean a pretty pure life. So when he says, I am a man of unclean lips, where does that leave some of us? But when he saw the holiness of God and compared his humanness next to God's, he said, ha, I am nothing. Why would I doubt my God, my almighty, all-powerful God in all situations? Oh, I'd love to be up and standing up, and I can't stand up. Okay, so. <laughs> and I live among a people of unclean lips. He saw the world for what it was. God gave him a vision of himself. God gave him a vision of the world against an almighty God. So not only did Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live on a world of unclean lips. And wow, I would say that today we live in a world of unclean lips. Yes. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Wow. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. How many here would say that? If the Lord spoke to you today, how many would raise your hand and say, Here I am, send me. Don't even ask where. Don't even ask how. Don't even ask to where. Some people say, you can send me anywhere, but don't send me to Africa. <laughs> you know, we really need to think about would, what would we say? I have friends who the Lord has spoken similar words to over the years, and they have sold everything, sold everything and moved to whatever country they felt the Lord was talking to them, and they're still in those countries. And they're leading hundreds of people to the Lord. People are dying all over the world, and they're not going to be with the Lord. You and I can impact people either for good or for bad. We impact people for bad when we don't talk to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. We impact people in their eternity when we don't speak to them about their eternity because perhaps we were the last ones that were going to have an opportunity to speak to them about their eternity and we didn't do it and they died in an auto accident. We impacted their eternity. Or maybe we did. We shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And we led them into the, we'll just say the salvation prayer. And they accepted the Lord and they realized who they were. We impacted their eternity. Do you see how God has called each one of us? We have a call, a mighty call, a phenomenal call. And many of us are not stepping into that. I'm not just talking to Cornerstone Church here. I'm talking to whomever is listening to us when they pick it up on the web. King Uzziah had become a distraction to Isaiah. You see, Uzziah had taken Isaiah in under his wing. So, so Isaiah was kind of sort of like mentoring under Uzziah. Not really because Isaiah was a prophet, but he, but he was following Uzziah. He was under his, his mentorship, we'll say, to some degree. And, but he had become a distraction to Isaiah. And it was only when he died that Isaiah saw the Lord. It's only when that distraction was removed that Isaiah saw the Lord. Uzziah is a contracted form, the name Uzziah of Azariah, meaning the Lord is my strength. One of Amaziah's sons, who the people made king of Judah in his father's stead. He was, he was a king for 52 years, and he reigned pretty good for 52 years. He was the most prosperous except Jehoshaphat since Solomon's time. He was a vigorous ruler. His name had spread abroad, even entered into Egypt. And in the earlier part of his reign, under the rule of Zechariah, under the reign of Zechariah, he, he did pretty well. But then somewhere along the line, 
Toward the close of his life, his heart was lifted up to destruction. He began to want to do other things. He began to be prideful. He began to want to go into the temple and worship just as the priest did. He wanted to lead worship as the priest did. His heart was lifted up with pride. Well, you know that's a no-no. You could get struck down by lightning doing that. But the close of his long life, he entered the sanctuary proceeding to offer incense on the golden altar, an absolute no-no. Azariah the high priest saw the tendency of such a daring act on part of the king, and with a band of 80 priests, he withstood him. Uzziah was suddenly struck with leprosy while in the act of offering the incense, and he was driven from the temple and lived in a special little house all separate by himself, and he was buried in a separate grave. Isaiah learned that position was not what he should be seeking. The only position that we need to be seeking is that one in chair one where we sit with the Lord Amen. and we lean back in his arms and we open our ears and we listen. That's the position we're to be in, to be in that right position to be able to hear. When the man who had taken care of him died, Isaiah turned again to the Lord and it was then he received his vision. After Isaiah saw the Lord, he saw himself. Isaiah realized how far he drifted away from the Lord, <laughs> how far he drifted away from God and now finally he saw God again, and he realized how unclean he was because he had drifted ever so slightly. We don't read about Isaiah sinning in any way, but what we see here is that he moved away from the Lord. He, how many here can realize that we can see ourselves over the last three, four, six, eight months that we perhaps were on fire six months ago, and now we're just kind of got some hot coals going? We just move away just a little bit. That's all it takes. Because when we move away just that little bit, whew, the wind of the Holy Spirit doesn't touch us the same. And Isaiah saw himself and saw what had happened. Saw that he had moved away ever so. He didn't even know he had done it, I'm sure. And we often don't know we've done it. Because it's so subtle. That's how the enemy gets in. It's so subtle. We think we're fine. Everything's okay. I'm still reading my Bible. I'm doing my daily devotions. I'm in church on Sunday. I give my tithes and my offerings. I'm fine. Really? Hmm. Do you know what? You know when you're not fine? Those of you who are part of our family on a regular basis and some that are not here today, I know when you're not fine. The Holy Spirit, when you walk up to me and you go to give me a hug or shake my hand, I know right away when you're not fine. I don't care how big your smile is. I don't care what you tell me. I don't care. I don't care. I hear what the Holy Spirit says to me, and I know that you're not fine. And know that only because I love you. Mostly, he loves you. So, I'm saying to the church this morning, God has a job for someone to do. There's work to be done. And the position is open. Who wants to fill it? There's a job to do. God is calling us. There's a job to do. Who wants to do it? Who wants to raise their hand? Who wants to step into my office and say, here I am, Lord. I'll do Here I am, Lord. No, here I am, Don. Here I am, Pastor. I'll do it. Without even knowing what it is. I've got a whole list of jobs that the Holy Spirit has put before me that we have yet to do, that we thought we were going to get done this summer and it hasn't happened because, 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 because no one steps up, or very few. So who will go and do the work of the Lord in this generation? Matthew 28, verse 19. Here's the job. Here's the position. Here's the description. Go therefore. Read it with me. If it's up there, read it with me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's your job description. Let's look at one other just in case you think that's the only place. Turn to Mark 16. Mark 16. Verses 15 and 16. Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said to them, quote, Is it up there? Yeah. Go into all the world 
There's that word go. You know that little two-letter word? Huh. That's got, that carries an awful lot of weight behind it. Go into all the world. Read it with me. And preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. But he who is, has disbelieved shall be condemned. Matthew 9. Matthew 9, verse 37 and 38. Matthew 9, 37 and 38. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Can anybody say amen? amen. amen. And you shall be my... Whoops, I'm wrong... Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. How can we do this job? The job description is so simple, so basic, and so difficult. Not easy for everyone. Not easy for anyone. One time, you know, way back probably, I don't know, maybe 25 years ago, I was in some country, I don't remember, uh, maybe it was Nigeria, and it, when they introduced me, now this is probably 25 years ago, and. And so they're introducing me, and there were about, I don't know, 200 people there and, and uh, at this place, this gathering, and I was going to be preaching, and, and the interpreter interpreted so that I could understand what they were saying in Nigerian. So the interpreter, when I preach, the interpreter interprets into their language, but when they're preaching, someone interprets into American, into English, so that I can understand what they're saying about me or about whatever they're saying. So I said... What did, what did he just say? And the interpreter said, he just said, I, <laughs> I, okay, are you with me? This is what he said to me. He just said, she doesn't look like much sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> She's pretty short, pretty plain, but she brings a powerful word from the Lord. What part do you think I hung on to? <laughs> So I, I said, oh, God, you have a way of humbling people, don't you? <laughs> she doesn't look like much, you know. <laughs> so, okay, all right. So uh, the job, what's the job? Can you tell me what the job is? Now we've just read the job description. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Reach the lost at any cost. Reach the lost at any cost. Oh, do you want to know what the pay is? Are you interested in that? Suffering. <laughs> Suffering. Yeah. <laughs> Suffering. <laughs> Being arrested. Okay. Put in jail. <laughs> Turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Verses 26 and 27. Matthew 16, 26 and 27. For what will a man be profited if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then recompense every man according to his deeds. Well, that's either exciting or makes you nervous, one of the two. Some say, I don't, I don't care, I just want to be there. I don't care where I'm sitting, I just want to be there. Well, praise God for that. But you know what? I would just love to meet whatever people in the kingdom that go into the kingdom in eternity who I played any small part in helping them get there. And by that I mean I just may have been just one more person that preached the gospel. I may have been the 22nd person. I may have been the first. Just one small part. Would that be a reward or what? 
I've been fortunate enough to have people in different countries call me mom. And the only reason they call me mom is not because I'm so old, <laughs> but because in the third world countries, if you lead them to salvation, you become their mother in the Lord, their spiritual mother. So what are the benefits? Must be benefits with this job. Turn to Romans 14. Romans 14, verse 17. <coughs> Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Often when I'm gone into a third world country, sometimes I'll awaken, be awakened in the middle of the night as I was when I first was uh, coming under the influence of this burst appendix and didn't know what it was. And there's a thought that comes into my, that's dropped into my spirit, which is dropped there by the enemy, about how serious this is going to be or about something he's doing. But immediately, when I realize what's happening, and I rebuke that by the blood in the name of Jesus Christ, and a peace comes over me. I've had the enemy tell me in a country many years ago, Ed, in the middle of the night, wake up to, Ed was in a car accident. Now, because I'm prophetic and because I see into the spiritual realm, I often receive things from the Lord. So in the middle of the night, waking up out of a sound sleep, Ed was in a car. I heard the, I heard the crash of cars, and I suddenly knew that Ed had been in a car accident. And, of course, I sat up in bed when I realized, that's not God. You know how I knew it wasn't God? God would never tell me that. Let's say it had actually happened. God would never tell me that. That would not be what I would hear that would bring fear. And so immediately, he rebuked that voice, lay back down, total peace. That can only be in the Holy Spirit. Can't be any other way. So, and a life insurance policy that's out of this world. <laughs> I mean, that's the, what's the best job I can think of. But I'd say to you this morning, it's not the most qualified, it's not the best dressed, not the first ones that came to the Lord. But the ones that will get the nod from the Lord of the harvest are those who will hear his still, small voice and respond and know what the purpose of the church is today. The purpose of the church is not just to come to church on a Sunday and say, well, I did it and paid my offerings and my tithes. It's not just to come to church and be there and say, hi, I saw you in church on Sunday, and be able to tell other people I was in church on Sunday. That's not the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is to impact people for eternity. And I want and I ask us, I challenge each one of us, are we doing that? Each one of us, with the people we meet every day, with the people at our jobs, with the people we travel with, with the people that we see, with the people we meet on the street. How many times at a restaurant have you asked the waitress, that you, you don't know the waitress, she comes and waits on your table and you see her name tag and you say, uh, hi Debbie, how are you? And Debbie says, I'm fine. And you say, hey Debbie, do you have any prayer needs today? Do you have anything I could pray for you for? Well, sometimes they're, oh yes I do. They never say no. I have never in 30 years had a waitress or waiter say no. And some of them start to cry. Some of them say, how did you know? Well, just the Holy Spirit, and just pray with them. Anyone whose attention is not diverted by the other sounds and all the clamber that's around and competes for our attention, who don't think that they already have arrived, that they deserve the job because they have superior qualifications, but those who are listening and understanding the voice of the Lord. We can argue all day long among ourselves, and we can use scripture to back up why we're right and why everyone else is wrong, we can argue about doctrine. We can argue about, I don't believe this part of the Bible, but I believe this part of the Bible. We can argue all you want. I don't care. But God has called us to one purpose. Well, I do care. <laughs> but it's not that important. What's really important is what God has called us to. And God has called us to one purpose. One purpose, that's all. So... The ones who God will work through in this generation are the ones who have eliminated all the distractions. That's it. 
How many feel like you have eliminated all the distractions? I just, one hand going up would be nice. <laughs> How many feel like you've eliminated some of the distractions? All right, praise God. How many are working on getting rid of some of the others as much as you can? There are some things you can't get rid of, but you can learn how to deal with them and not let them overwhelm you. It's the overwhelming part that's a problem. Not the most educated, not the best dressed, not the ones with the most impressive heritage, but all those who have eliminated distractions. Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6. Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6. Who may ascend unto the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of those who seek him, who seek thy face, even Jacob. Now it's interesting in this scripture, if you would be sure you're on the part that says he who has clean hands and a pure heart, Deb, Deb, if you're, be sure you're on the scripture part that has a clean hands and pure heart. Okay, can you give me the verse four? Psalm 24, okay. verses 3 through 6. Three through six. It's interesting to note that one of the meanings of both of the words used here, clean and pure, the word clean and the word pure, the meaning is the same. Clear. Clear. Not muddled, not double-minded, but clear, unhindered direction. Matthew 6.22 says the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. So the distractions that are all around us, our eyes have got to be clear on the Lord. Our ears have to be open and pure to hear what the Lord is telling us. I believe that God is, it's not a talent to do that, by the way. It's just an understanding. It's a discipline of knowing what to do, how to listen to the Lord. I believe that God is simply looking for people who will eliminate the distractions as much as you can. Not all distractions will ever be eliminated unless you become a monk. And that's not highly... Oh, well, forget that. Okay, so <laughs> God didn't call you to be a monk. People who will keep their purpose clear, their lives uncluttered and free from the things of the world that divert our attention away from the still, small voice of God. People that will not only hear but understand what God is saying. How many know that you've heard something from some time from God? You know you heard it. And maybe it was a little piece of direction. But you didn't do it. Or you said, well, later. Or I don't have time. Or I'll think about it next month. And then it disappeared. Did God forget? No. So we have to be clear. Our eyes have to be clear. So it's one thing to hear the voice. It's another thing to know where it's coming from and what it's saying. I'm going to give you an example of a Zulu man. A Zulu man was taken from the bush where he'd been born and raised and he'd lived all his life and now he was much older. And he was taken to the big metropolitan city of Johannesburg. As they were walking down the street and the Zulu man was looking up at all the buildings and all the traffic and hearing all the signs, horns were blaring, people were yelling, whistles were blowing, sirens were screaming. I mean, there was so much noise and suddenly he stopped. And he said to his host, listen. And his host said, listen to what? And, the ho and he said, that cricket. And the, Zulu, and the host said, what? That cricket. Do you hear that cricket? And the host said, are you kidding me? With all of this noise, all of this around us, how can you possibly hear a cricket? And with that, the Zulu man went over to the little trees that were planted in the boulevards, dug in the grass, and brought out a cricket. 
What was his, his ear tuned to? The sounds of the bush. And so even in all the noise and all the distractions, he heard that cricket. That's supposed to be you and I. That when the sounds are the most, when it's the loudest, when we wonder how in the world are we going to get through this, that's when we hear the voice of the Lord that says, no, don't move, or says stand, or go, or stop, or listen, or stay where you are, or run like heck. Zulu's practiced ear could pick up the sound of the cricket amidst all the noise. His ears were turned to the cricket. What's your ear tuned to? All the distractions? All the noises? All the demands? Because you're going to hear all those things. But if you're really tuned to the Holy Spirit, you'll hear the Holy Spirit over them and through them. Last scripture, John 10. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I pray that your ears will be tuned to the Holy Spirit, and that distractions can be set aside and not become overwhelming. I ask that you pray for me while I'm in South Africa. Some of the most powerful times of being with God for me have been in South Africa. And so I know and expect an encounter with the Lord there. So pray for me that I hear the voice of the Lord. The worship team can come back up. Let's close in prayer and then join us for fellowship. Father, I pray, Lord, that you help us to eliminate as many distractions as we can, that our ears will be focused on you, that there will be clear and understanding and obedience, Lord. Father, I pray for each person here that you guide them and lead them and protect them and keep them safe. I pray, Father, that each and every one of us will meet again soon here and, Lord, that the day will come that we will spend eternity with you together once again as a family. I pray for the church family that's not here today to be with each and every one. I pray for health and protection in each family. And I ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.